In this video, I'll demonstrate one method of making a locket with an impression die. You'll need to choose your impression die and cut a piece of sheet metal slightly larger than the die itself. I'd give yourself at least an eighth of an inch on all sides. And you're actually going to need two pieces of sheet metal, front and back, for the locket. This is 16 gauge. It's pretty heavy. You could definitely use 18 or maybe even 20 gauge, but I personally wouldn't go thinner than that. So go ahead and cut your pieces of sheet metal out. And then our next step will be to take it over to our annealing, annealing pan and soften the metal. We're gonna heat it up to annealing temperature. And what this will do is we'll make the metal malleable so that it will form into the impression die nicely and we can get as much detail as possible. So I'm just going to heat the silver to a soft, very soft, dull red, and then I'll pickle it and clean it and then it's ready to use in the impression die. So here I'm gonna make sure my metal is centered over the impression, and then I'm going to center it in the press using urethane and a tool steel pusher. I'm just using a small piece of urethane here, making sure that everything is centered, and then pressing the metal into the die. Then I'm gonna check to see my progress and then move the urethane and continue pressing until I think I've gotten as much detail as possible. I like to move the urethane a bit and rotate and continue to press. Okay, let's check it and see our progress. Just gonna use a chisel to pop the metal out of the die. And I'm starting to get the shape of the die, but there's a lot more detail to be had. So one thing that's gonna help me is trimming off excess metal. I'm gonna trim all the way around the shape while still leaving a small lip. So just use your jeweler saw and cut away the excess material um, but leaving a small lip to make sure you can still pop the shape out of the impression die after pressing. So here I've cut away most of the excess. And I'm also going to anneal again in order to help make the metal softer and help me get more detail out of that die. So again, I'm just going to use the torch and heat the metal to a soft, dull red glow. And then I'll pickle it and clean it, and it'll be ready to use in the impression die again. Make sure after you pickle and clean that your metal is completely dry before putting it back into the impression die. Now here's where we have to be careful. We have to make sure we line up our initial pressing correctly in the die. So... Um, I kind of scoot the metal around in the die until I find it where it seats itself. And then I kind of jiggle it around with my finger a little bit to make sure it's really seated nicely before I begin pressing again. And again, I'm going to use small pieces of urethane. Rotate and press, rotate and press, and press multiple times. It often takes um, a significant amount of time and multiple pressings to get all of the detail out of a die. And every die is different. Some are easier to press and get detail than others. This one is fairly deep in the details, so it's taking a little bit more effort. And also my metal is pretty thick. Another trick I like to use to try and get more detail out of a die is to use crumpled up aluminum foil. This acts as a slightly more solid pusher behind the metal rather than urethane, um, which is a bit more flexible. So I just crinkle up a piece of aluminum foil like you would use on your leftovers, leftover dinner, 
and kind of crunch it up into a ball here and then I'm gonna press it in the press. It will compress a lot and squish. Um, so I'm gonna squish this all the way down and then I'm gonna take it out and I'm gonna cut away the excess so I'm just left with the kind of solid pusher in the shape of my impression die. So I'm cutting away this extra material that I don't need so that I can focus the force into the impression die. Okay, and now I can use this as a more solid pusher to press my metal into the die. And again, I'm gonna press and rotate, press and rotate, and then check my results again. You can also use crumpled up paper towels. That works really well. Um, some people use cardboard or even leather. You can also make yourself a solid aluminum force, but sometimes the, the crumpled up aluminum foil is just a little bit easier. It's just quicker. Okay, so I'm gonna pop this out and check out how it looks. Definitely starting to get more of the depth, but I still feel like there's more detail in the dye that I can get. So I'm gonna um, combine both urethane and my aluminum pusher. So I'm seating the metal in the dye, making sure it's placed correctly. And then I'm gonna find a really small piece of urethane. The crumbly old bits that are really beat up tend to work best for this. I'm gonna place it in there and then I'm gonna put my aluminum pusher, my little aluminum force on top and I'm gonna press them together. And so that aluminum is gonna force the urethane down into the deepest parts of the dye. And I'm just rotating and continuing to press multiple times. Okay, so now we're gonna check it out and look at the progress and see if we've gotten all the detail. That looks pretty good. I don't think I'm gonna get a whole lot more detail than that. So now I'm ready to move on to the next step, which is cutting out the design. I'm gonna go ahead and use my jeweler saw and cut off all that excess metal around the perimeter of the impression. So I'm gonna cut almost right to the edge, but I'm gonna give myself a tiny lip. And that's gonna help me when I go to solder my interior frame on, because I'm gonna put a little interior frame on the inside of these locket halves. So I'm leaving just a teeny tiny lip here, um, probably between half a millimeter and one millimeter wide. And then once I've cut and filed all the way around the perimeter, I'm ready to sand the bottom completely flat. It needs to be completely flat because I am going to solder, like I said, a small frame on the inside. And in order to get a good clean solder joint, I need to make sure that this piece is completely flat. You can sand on uh, just a coarse sandpaper, or this is a like diamond knife sharpening block from Harbor Freight, um, but it works great for flattening things out like this. So just continue sanding until you remove all of the high spots um, and get everything completely flat. Now I'm ready to cut my frame pieces. So I'm using a disc cutter. You could cut them out by hand with a saw just using a circle template. Um, but this is gonna save me a little bit of time. So I chose a larger punch for the outside perimeter of my frame piece, and now I'm looking for a smaller punch for the interior part of the frame. And this will make a lot more sense in a minute when you see the pieces cut. Okay, so I cut out my circles. I made basically washers, um, and these are gonna get soldered on the bottom of these locket pieces to create a small frame on the inside of the locket, like this. 
So now I need to make sure these washers are completely flat as well because I've sanded down the edge of the locket pieces, but I also need to make this flat for soldering. So again, I'm just going to sand these flat and I just use masking tape as a little handle to help me out. But I'm just gonna sand these down until I have completely sanded all the high spots down and they're all completely flat. Now I have two nice flat pieces and I'll get a really clean solder join. And then um, the excess material will get cut away from the outside border again. So I'm setting up for soldering, laying everything out on my solder board. And I'm gonna flux the whole back side of these washers because I'm going to sweat solder. So what I'm gonna do is I am going to flood the back of these washers with solder and then I'll place the locket halves on top of this and reheat the pieces so the solder will flow and join the locket half to this frame piece. Basically just sweat soldering them together. This will give me a cleaner joint. I won't have any solder running up on the face of the locket halves, which I want to avoid. Um, so I think this will be the cleanest way to do it. So I'm just placing a whole bunch of little cut up solder chips over here and then I'm ready to um, get these soldered. And I need to flux my locket halves as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And once everything is fluxed, then I'm ready to start heating and getting these pieces soldered together. So I'm gonna go ahead and just place my solder chips. This part is a little tedious because I need to put several solder chips all the way around the frame. So I'm gonna go ahead and speed this part of the video up a bit. So you can see I'm just placing the chips with a little bit of space in between them, making sure I get even coverage so that when I flow this solder, it's going to be enough to join the two pieces of metal together, the locket half and this frame. And then once I have all my solder placed, I'm just gonna heat until the solder flows and floods that surface. Some people also uh, refer to this process as tinning. It's different than tinning like a copper pot for eating, but a similar idea or flooding the so surface with a lower melting temperature alloy, which is the solder. And then I, I noticed a couple more places that I need a little bit more solder than I think I have on there. So I'm just adding a couple of extra chips here and there, and then we'll get everything flowed. Okay, that looks pretty good. Now I'm just gonna evenly heat until the solder flows. And I'm using hard solder here because I'm going to have a few more soldering operations in this project. The solder flowed, so now I'm ready to bring the, the locket half over, place it on top, make sure that it's centered, and then I'm just going to heat the whole thing up and bring it up to the melting temperature of the solder again, and the solder will flow and join the two pieces. I'm gonna add a little bit of flux on the, the back here. Um, I don't have a fire scale inhibitor, but I do have flux, so I'm gonna go ahead and use this in hopes of saving myself from a little bit of fire scale on the back side here. Or I guess it's the front side. 
Okay, so now I've got even flux. I'm gonna make sure the piece is centered and I'm gonna get it hot enough for that solder to flow. Okay. Still just trying to get it perfectly centered. All right, here we go. So really even heat. The solder has already flowed to that bottom frame um, and the pieces are touching so they'll heat together. All I really need to do is bring this top piece up to the temperature that the solder flows at. And then I can see that the solder flowed all the way around and my two pieces are joined. So now I have my two locket halves completely soldered nice and clean and I'm ready to cut off the excess material around the perimeter of the locket. So I'm just gonna go ahead and do that with my jeweler's saw, trimming off this border of material that I don't need. And once I've done that, I can file it clean And I'm not filing completely to the design here, but pretty close. Um, because once I get a bit closer, we are going to actually do this now. We're gonna super glue the two halves together and file them at the exact same time so that we can make sure they're completely identical and exactly the same shape and size so that they fit together really nicely. So I'm just putting little dabs of super glue around the inner frame. Don't need a ton. And then I'm going to put the two halves together. Let the super glue dry. Um, and then I'll file them at the same time. So you can see I didn't use a lot of super glue, just a few dabs. And then I'll place this other half on top and compress them, give it a little pressure, make sure everything's lined up where it should be. And then I can file these two pieces at the same time so that they have identical, uh, you know, flush perimeters, flush edges. And then I'll be able to also file the channel for my hinge, for my cradle hinge. So once the glue has dried, you can go ahead and start filing. And I'm just using a nice large flat file here. And I'm gonna file until everything is the same level. Everything is nice and smooth. So this is all filed and sanded. It looks pretty good. And I'm ready to start filing the, the little cradle for my cradle hinge. Here I have a round file and I'm just gonna file right in the center area, right in between the two halves and start creating a channel for that hinge to lay down in. So this is gonna take some time and because the file, if you're using a tapered file like I am, you're gonna need to flip your piece back and forth so that you're not filing unevenly. So file from both sides. And you're gonna file significantly down into the material. It's okay if you file all the way through your border um, what you're doing is you're making space for this tubing to rest. And so the more you file down, the more your hinge will kind of be hidden in the profile of the piece rather than sticking way out. So you can see how I've just created that, that cradle here for the knuckle hinge. So I'm going to stop here. This looks pretty good. I filed that channel in there. And now I'm ready to cut my pieces of tubing for my knuckle hinge. Um, whenever you have a knuckle hinge, you want to have an odd number of knuckles and you want the, the side with the least number of knuckles to be, you know, the pieces of 
tubing, each of those knuckles you want to be longer. So I'm gonna do a three knuckle hinge and my middle knuckle needs to be slightly wider than my other two knuckles. This is a miter cutting jig and I'm gonna use it to cut my tubing nice and flush, nice and square, so that everything will line up perfectly. Hinges need to be pretty precise and everything needs to line up, otherwise you won't be able to get your hinge set. So I've, these tools are really nice because you can file right up against the surface and get your edges nice and flat. Um, so I filed the end of this tubing and now I'm gonna determine how long I want my knuckles. You can use a ruler and measure everything out. I am being a little bit lazy because this is just a demo, so I'm kind of eyeballing it. And I'm gonna cut my middle knuckle first. So this, this piece here is gonna be the middle of my hinge. And I've locked the tubing down in the jig, and I'm just going to cut this section off. With my saw blade, um, I noticed a slight burr on the end here. I'm just gonna take care of that with a little scrap of sandpaper really quick. And now I'm ready to cut this piece. So again, you can cut right up against this tool. It's a very handy tool to have. If you don't have one, you can just measure your tubing and do all of this by hand. Um, you just have to be a bit more careful. So I've cut my little middle knuckle here. It's pretty tiny. And I'm going to put it back in the jig so that I can file the edge that I sawed completely flat. Because even though you're sawing right up against the edge of the jig, it's not gonna be perfect. So I can go ahead and file this at a complete 90 degree angle, and then I know both ends of my tubing are 90 degrees, and they'll meet the other two knuckles perfectly. So then I'll open this up and drop this little piece out of here, and I'll be ready to cut my my other two knuckles for my hinge. So that'll rest just down in that cradle very nicely. And I can see um, I'm eyeballing about how long I need my second and third knuckles, and they'll be identical in length. So that's another nice thing about this little jig is that you can use it to cut multiple pieces identical lengths. And I'll show you how to do that here in just a second. So I'm inserting the tubing into the jig, tightening it down at the length that I want. And now I'm going to add um, the little stop that comes with the jig. It's just this little L-shaped bar. It goes down in this hole, there's a set screw that can lock it in place, and it acts as a stop for the tubing. So if you need to cut 50 pieces all identical lengths, you can do that with this little stop. So I'm butting it up against the end of my tube and locking it down, and then I know my, my other knuckle, the last knuckle that I need, will be the same length as this knuckle. They'll be identical. And then I can go ahead and just saw through this with my saw blade again. And I'll do the same thing when I'm done sawing these. I will put them back in the jig and file the sawed end completely flat so that I know all ends are 90 degrees. So just stick those back in there and file them flat. Precision is really key with hinges. So I'm just tucking it in there, barely sticking out so I can file that end nice and flush. Okay, and then once you have all of your knuckles cut, you're ready to prepare the, the piece for soldering. And the soldering is definitely the trickiest part. So I can see all my knuckles fit nicely in this little cradle here. You can do it differently. You can make your knuckles a little bit longer so the hinge extends, you know, a little wider than the perimeter of your locket. However you wanna do it is fine. This is just how I'm doing it for this demo. So this is a little secret that I learned when I was in school. 
is to use graphite just for like a mechanical pencil to hold the hinge straight um, and lined up as you solder because the whole thing has to get soldered all at once. The knuckles have to be lined up. Otherwise, it's very unlikely that you'll ever get everything lined up perfectly. So you can slide your little sections of tubing onto this graphite and it will hold everything in place while you solder, but the tubing won't solder to the graphite. Um, some people use like old drill bits that they oil and you know make kind of dirty so that the solder hopefully won't stick to them, but I've found that graphite works really well for me. See how everything fits perfectly together and it holds it all straight? And then this is another secret that I like to use. I like to use Ronda Coriel's masking mud and you can use that as an anti-solder. So I will paint it, I'll brush it onto the areas where I don't want solder to flow. So like in between each of the knuckles and on the edges of the knuckles on the side of the locket where I don't want them soldered. Um, and this will help, help you be a little more successful um, because there's nothing more frustrating than doing all of this work and getting to this point and then having your whole hinged solder completely shut and everything freeze up. And that's really frustrating. <laughs> it's happened to me multiple times. So I really like this masking mud. Um, some people also use yellow ochre powder. You can make a paste to just add water to yellow ochre. So you can see I'm just using a small brush. I'm trying to be pretty controlled with this. And I'm dabbing it on in between each of the knuckles. And all this does is it makes the metal dirty so that the solder won't want to flow in those areas because solder really likes clean metal. It does not like dirty metal. So I'm brushing it on, making the metal dirty in those areas. Um, and hopefully making it so the solder won't flow and you know turn this into one solid piece because that would defeat the purpose <laughs> and then i'm going to also brush some of this on um, because the middle knuckle is going to get soldered to one side of the locket and then the other two knuckles are going to get soldered to the opposite side of the locket so i'm brushing this everywhere where i don't want solder to flow and typically when i make a locket i bind it with binding wire um, but we didn't have any here at the studio so i'm just using a third hand to hold my locket together and hoping that nothing moves so i've got my my hinge here on my graphite setting it in the cradle and then i'm going to be really conservative with my flux because Flux keeps the metal clean and it's going to assist in solder flowing. And I don't want solder flowing all over the place, as I just mentioned before, because it will make my hinge not work. So I'm being really stingy with my flux, only brushing it on right where I need it and nowhere else. Um, so I'm putting it on the middle knuckle so the middle knuckle can solder to the front of the locket. And then I'll put a little tiny bit of flux on the back side on those two outer knuckles okay and then once um i'm finished preparing this it takes a significant amount of time when i set all of this up for soldering because i just really don't want the solder to flow where it shouldn't so once you're done brushing on your, your anti-solder, the masking mud, and the flux, then you're ready to solder. Um, but be prepared for the prep to take a fair amount of time. Okay, so I think my prep is done and I'm finally ready to get this soldered. I have a small assortment of solder chips over to my right and I'm just going to start evenly heating this piece 
want to make sure that moisture kind of um, boils off without the flux spreading into areas I don't want it or anything like that. So I'm just heating really slowly, gently. I'm going to ball up these pieces of solder because I want them to be like as less likely to completely spread out as possible. Um, and if you think about a flat chip versus a fully round sphere, the surface area that it's touching on your metal is much smaller with the sphere. So I can place this little tiny sphere in the middle of this center knuckle and heat it just until it flows enough to get that middle knuckle soldered, but not enough that the solder continues to spread and solders the whole hinge shut. So I'm going to heat it until it's almost to soldering temperature, and then I'll place that solder pallion right in the center of that middle knuckle hinge. Okay, it's pretty tiny. I know it's hard to see. And then I'm just going to heat until that solder flows right there. I haven't put any solder on the other two knuckles yet because I'm trying to be very controlled about my heat and just do one thing at a time. So the solder flowed on that middle knuckle and now I'm ready to, to solder the other two knuckles on the reverse side of the locket. So again, I'm just melting the solder into a small little sphere and then placing it um, on these outer knuckles, I'm placing it right on the edge, the outer edge of the knuckle so that it's less likely to flow into that center knuckle, if that makes sense. And then again, just really even heating until the solder just barely flows, and then I wanna pull my heat away. And do that for each of the, the outer two knuckles. Whenever I'm doing this, I always realize that I've been holding my breath for a really long time and I have to like remember to breathe because it's really frustrating when the whole thing solders shut. So we'll heat this until the solder flows and then it'll be our moment of truth and we'll see if we were able to get the knuckles soldered in place without them soldering all together into one big, one big long tube. So after it's soldered, let it cool just for a second and then you can quench it. And then we'll test it out and see. Oh, it's my lucky day. So I was able to get this soldered with each of the knuckles in place and it didn't freeze up, which is great. So I will pickle it and clean it. Um, and I have some excess solder to remove and next steps would be to do final finishing, create a little catch, and set the hinge pin. Um, but this is all I am going to do for this video. So that is how you make a small knuckle hinge locket with a like a three knuckle cradle hinge. And there are a huge variety of impression dies that this technique would work for. So go ahead and try it at home and show us what you make.